My plans for today are the following. Uh, I could not, protein design is a hot topic and there's a lot of things happening both in research and the world and not to mention big pharma industry. Uh, I suspect that half of the things I tell you today are gonna to be completely outdated within a couple of years. But since it's very difficult to find any information in books about this, I figured I should share a few slides with you at least. And that might take, depending on how much questions you have and how interested you are, anything between 30 and 45 minutes. Then I might not do a break. Well, it depends a bit on your taste. Uh, but then I figured then after that I'm going to be around for questions and answers relating to everything in the course, repetition, questions about the exam, life, the universe, everything as long as you want, but in case you just have one or two questions, it's stupid for you to go away 15 minutes on a break before we get back. And in principle, I need to go to the US on Friday morning, but uh, I can be around here until then. Uh, hopefully it's not gonna take that long. And then let's see. We might, I might give you a little, I don't I haven't prepared any slides about hand in task three, but if you have questions about hand in task three, we can certainly repeat that too and go through it a bit. So drug design, both hand in task three and the last lecture I gave you are very much related uh, to drug design, of course. And drug design, you can approach it top down or bottom up. You can think of yourself as pharma or a doctor being interested in curing a particular disease. For some of these diseases, we hardly know anything about them on the molecular level, while for others, such as insulin, there's like 50, 60 years of research. We know pretty much everything in and out. It's just that we don't have a perfect drug yet. Historically, as I mentioned last week, virtually everything in drug design has been about serendipity. Uh, you happen to find something that works, and then you purify this, or somehow improve the doses, treatments, whatever, and then hopefully you find something that is, well, working so that you can administer the patients and actually cure the disease. What's happened the last 20, maybe even, well, roughly 20 years, is that there's been a very increased focus on designing drugs. There are two reasons for that. One of them is that we want to be able to use drugs for diseases that we previously haven't been able to treat. Um, there simply might not be anything that bind well enough. I mentioned, I mentioned that last week, that even if you do find something that bind, if the binding affinity is not high enough, you would need an insanely large dose, maybe kilos per day. And in practice, that's not going to work due to side effects. And those side effects means that all the food and drug administrations all over the world are going to be worried, and then you might not get the drug approved. And even if you did get it approved, most of us would not want to take a lifestyle drug if there are too many side effects. Sure, if it's going to cure a fatal cancer disease, then you might do it, but not to, say, reduce your levels of cholesterol. The other challenge there is that all the regulatory demands have increased. Uh, we will not accept random deaths. Uh, and random deaths might sound horrible, but in many cases, this might correspond to a small genotype variation, a deviation in your genome that you just happen to be one in 100,000, which is too bad if you die from the drug. Um, and, and that's, I, I realize how horrible that sounds, but a lot of health has to be approached on a population level, right? If, there, if it is a disease that is otherwise fatal, but this drug will cure 999,999 uh, 99 people out of a million, but one in a million will die, it's probably a pretty wise drug to take uh, because the alternative is dying with 100% certainty. What is increasingly happening though is that we're running out of ideas, or rather not really running out of ideas, but we're not, our methods are not good enough. We can't design a custom drug to do anything in the body. Uh, we need some sort of lead. We need something that at least starting to bind to a receptor. It's very difficult for you to say, pick and well, forget about binding. I talked about binding pockets last week, right? But forget about the binding pocket. Assuming that there is a new random protein that we know that that protein is relevant to cancer and there is a particular mutation in it. But there isn't any binding pocket. That might not be involved in binding as part of its normal uh, course of biological interaction. And yet I would like to change the way that protein works. How do we get something to bind? It doesn't have a binding pocket. And that's more difficult, right? Uh, if you don't, the second there is a pocket, the second there is something to start with, the approach I mentioned last week usually works. We just need to design something that is better, either better at binding than the natural ligand, or that somehow blocks the pocket so the natural ligand can't bind. And that's not impossible. Not trivial, mind you, but not impossible. So increasingly, we would like to do things that are completely from scratch or de novo, bottom up. Um, 
And what that has increasingly meant is that we no longer limit ourselves to small compounds. So that if you talk about modern drug design, there are very few examples of drugs like this on the market. Um, why? seems like obvious, right, that if, if there is so many, throughout the course you looked at all the diversity of protein structures. What if we could custom design proteins? I'm not sure what to compare this to. Well, you can imagine that using small ligands, that's kind of like living a shed in the forest. Designing proteins is like building. You can build houses. We can do absolutely anything. Only your imagination is the limit. So if that's such so obvious, why haven't we been doing it for 20 years? So was this course trivial? No, and the problem is it's not trivial. It's a pretty darn hard problem. Just predicting protein structure is very, very, very difficult. And now you're going to need to custom design not just protein structure, right? Because the structure is not going to get you anywhere. You need to custom design a function in a protein. And this seems easy. Just take a protein, and if you would like to create a more polar binding site, or say, more hydrophobic binding site, replace a couple of those polar residues with hydrophobic ones. What might happen? Yes, because in general, where do the hydrophobic... We talked about that through the entire first half of the course. What do the hydrophobic residues want to do? Where do you expect to see hydrophobic residues in a protein in general? Yes. So they don't want to be on the outside. So if you, it's easy, of course, it's completely trivial for me to show a picture like that. So imagine if there were some hydrophobic residues here. It would be a great binding site. The only problem is that nature doesn't agree. Nature thinks it's a really stupid idea to put those hydrophobic residues on the surface of a protein. So nature is going to fold a different protein. So you have your sequence. That was easy to make. The only problem is that you don't get that structure. And I'm not sure, did, the, did Lucy or Burke mention that? What is the probability of a random sequence folding into a protein? Any guess? 50-50? 1 in 10? 1 in 100? 1 in a million? So what happened, in, remember when I said that we talked about hydrophobic effect, and if you take a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acid in a chain, what will happen virtually instantly if you throw them in the water, in solution? Well, not really full, right? But you're going to get this hydrophobic collapse to what we call molten globular or something. But the point is that that's just a mix. That's just like mixing all the ingredients together. It's not yet any cake. So the question is, how many of these will then go over to form some very specific protein structure? I was about to say your guess is as good as mine. I don't think it is, because I know a little bit about, uh, more about this, but take a wild shot. You wish. Um, the likelihood is roughly, say, 1 in 10 to the power of 8 or so. So think a billion, rather. <laughs> so if you just randomly start to whip something up or replace residues, by default, things are not going to fold. There are some exceptions to this, because this applies to the entire protein. And nature wants things to be a little bit resistant. So it's normally, we don't like proteins where the entire stability is based on one residue. So you usually can change one or a few residues. But in general, we can't custom design or randomly do, uh, change protein structures. There's no longer going to be proteins. That is, this is very much related to the prions, though, that there are some proteins cannot of two states. Uh, normally, it doesn't happen. But say one in 10 million or one in a billion or something, you might actually have proteins that can occur in two stable states. And that's when we tend to get these strange things that have one native state and then one disease state that is also a protein. But it's very much the exception. So the problem here is that we would, it seems obvious that we, we would like to design proteins, but it's an exceptionally difficult problem. And it's also a problem that we can't just do in the lab. In theory, you could, of course, do random mutations in the lab. But again, those random mutations means that you're going to fail. Well, one time out of 100 million, you're going to be successful. And those are not pretty good odds, in particular when it's going to cost you time and effort for every protein. 
There are some solutions to that. You can actually do directed evolution in bacteria. Um, so we can pretty much try to randomly, with radioactivity or something, enforce, if you have some sort of biological process or surrounding, that will mean that, say that I would like to create proteins that are better at withstanding a high pH. If I then create an environment that it's an artificially high pH for this bacteria, and then I randomly force them to do mutations, then I will go through hundreds of millions of changes per day, and the bacteria that get good properties, they will tend to survive more. So we can cheat and, again, piggyback on evolution, but trying to do this with custom design and amino acid by amino acid deciding ourselves in the lab what we can do is not going to work. There are some things that work, though. Uh, when I was your age, there was nothing of the kind, but the last 10, 15 years has been a bit of a revolution. And I'm going to go back roughly 10 years to start, because this was one of the really cool examples. This is partly based on research, and well, mostly based on research on membrane proteins. And I'm going to go back to some things one of my students did 10 years ago. This is not the design, but this is an example of a very simple membrane and a model membrane and a single helix in that. And the reason we performed these studies is that at the time we were very interested in understanding membrane protein insertion. Why do membrane proteins insert? Well, we know that we normally don't want hydrophilic helis, uh, sorry, hydrophilic amino acids in a membrane protein, but under some conditions we could have them anyway. So we wanted to use, she wanted to use simulations to understand the properties of this hydrophilic amino acids in membrane and what happened. And I, what you saw here initially on, this is a helix with a lysine in it. Uh, and normally a lysine, that's even charged. We would never expect to see that in the membrane. But the reason why we could add that in the membrane is that the lysine will in practice stick out of the membrane and form, it's not even, since it's charged, we don't call them hydrogen bonds, but salt bridges with charged residues outside the membrane. We can do this in a slightly more advanced fashion. If you, look, if you take two lysines and put them almost in the middle of the helix, Again, just looking at the sequence, I would never say that that could go in the membrane. The reason why that will work, though, is that you see that they stick out and interact with other parts. This was part of a much larger project where we really went after biogenesis, designed predictors for uh, what things would insert. I can, as a small parenthesis, you might remember Lucy's lecture about voltage-gated ion channels. One of the reasons of this is that the voltage-gated channels, they contain a couple of charged residues, and we were Everyone in the field at the time were so perplexed how these charged residues could insert, and that's where they started from. Charged residues are exceptionally rare in membrane proteins, though. But in some conditions, interestingly enough, we can find not charged but polar residues, uh, serin and threonine. And if you simulate, if you put that in a computer simulation, it turns out that what they do. This OH group would normally hate to interact with the uh, lipid environment, but they get by by kind of sharing a bit of a hydrogen bond to the backbone here. So they're certainly not happy in the membrane, but it is possible to insert them. So that was a long parenthesis. Uh, the interesting thing is that to understand why do these occur in nature sometimes? Why would nature want to insert something slightly polar in the membrane? Because normally we would expect that the more non-polar, the more hydrophobic the helices are, the better they would be in membrane proteins. And they are better at the insertion, but there are some things that we can do with protein design while having charged ones. And this goes back to another very early discovery by Don Engelman at uh, Yale. Don, I think that Don is a candidate for a Nobel Prize, maybe together with Gunnar von Heine in a few years. But what they discovered very early on and worked a long time on is a very simple helices, a single helix at the time, but this helix has a very typical pattern of amino acids. They have a glycine, and then you have three residues that can be pretty much anything. That's why we call them X. And then you have to have another glycine. And they're also glycine, three Xs, and then glycine. So you call them, sometimes you even call them G, X, three in parenthesis, and G. And these helices are important because they can dimerize. Um, Exactly what they do is not relevant right now, but it's, this is just a toy system. But the, the, what they found out is that the importance of this pattern is that you remember what a glycine looks like. What is so particular with a glycine in terms of amino acids? What is the most important property of the side chain of the glycine? 
Yes, it's even so small that it doesn't exist. It's just a hydrogen. The glycine doesn't have a side chain. Uh, this is important, actually, when it comes to the exam. You should, I don't expect you to know all these amino acid sizes and draw them by heart. You need to understand why glycine is special, why proline is special, and then a couple of general properties. So if you have two helices and would like to put them next to each other, the other thing that's important, it might help to have something small, right? Because if you want two things to get close, it's good not to have anything between. How many amino acids are there per turn in a helix, in an alpha helix? 3.6. Ah, well, that's not an even number, but three is close enough, right? So those two glycines separated by, so you have a glycine, one, two, three, four. They're going to be almost on top of each other. So what this does is that it effectively creates a depression on the side of the helix. So let's see, I'm lousy at drawing. Uh, I need, let's see if I have some corner stuff here. So let's see, if we have one helix here, you essentially get something like that, right? If these are, and here we might have lots of side chains and everything, but there is something here that does not stick out as much because there are no side chains. Right, with those two guys, sorry. Imagine now if we take another helix, and this is where my drawing is gonna screw things up. That looks roughly like this. Then you're gonna have, if, you, if I want my two hands here to cross, right at the crossing point, it's nice not to have extra stuff, right? And if there is no extra stuff at the crossing point, this will enable them to get very close together. So in theory, this should enable us to create some very stable and nice small interfaces, but there is one problem. Why would the helices want to stick together? We want the helices to stick together because that might be very useful for professors in biophysics. But if this is in a membrane, the helices are, the left helix is entirely hydrophobic, and the right helix is entirely hydrophobic. What is your guess what they would do? If you think what, about what you've learned in this course, entropy in particular. So what will they interact with in a membrane? Yes, and the lipids are Yes, and the, lipids are hydro and the lipids are also hydrophobic, right? So lipids are hydrophobic and helices are hydrophobic. So if you're a residue that's hydrophobic, what is it best to interact with, hydrophobic or hydrophobic? It's the same. So if you now have two helices and there are no significant differences in interaction, what is better, to stay together or be separate? Why? Yes, you have higher entropy this episode. Putting them together means that we lose entropy. That's bad. That will never happen unless there is something else that is advantageous by being together. And there goes the plan of the biophysics professor to create a beautiful drug here. They're not going to, even if it's theoretically possible for them, that it's sterically possible for them to get together. There is nothing that prevents them from doing it. But there is no driving force whatsoever. Why should they? Yeah, it's a great idea, but then we have to go back to the traditional type of drug design. I can't design these helices to interact. But one thing that Don both noticed, there are very rare mutations, and then engineered. What if you have something like this? Is that serine happy there? Why? It's a charge. Well, polar, right? Uh, so you have partial charges. It is that threonine happy there? No, same reason, right? It's polar. But what if you took that serine helix on the left, turned it around 180 degrees, and put it right next to the threonine? So then, and if you think about this in terms of free energy, what would happen and why? Or what do we guess might happen? Yes, so is it good or bad from an entropy point of view? 
this is not trivial, but that's why I'm asking you the questions. Um, and this is why protein design, okay, we pretty much think about the simplest possible design case we can imagine, right? And already here we're stumbling a bit. But let's, whenever I ask anybody ask you about something about free energy, what do you do? What is the first thing you do? Stop hand waving. There is an equation. What is the equation? Good. And I would even I would even strongly advise you don't when we talk about changes, don't think F. Talk about delta F. So delta F equals delta E minus T delta S. And that might seem obvious again, but in the delta there means that you have to think about what is the before and what is the after. So the before is when we have two helices that do not interact. The after is when we have two helices that do interact. And what I'm essentially asking you, what is delta F? Is it negative, that's good, or positive, bad? And there are only two way, there are only two components of that. There's a delta E and delta S. So let's look at those. In this case, what is the delta E? What could two polar residues do, in particular with that little atom involved? What type? It could create a hydrogen bond. And is that good or bad? Good. Yes, in particular, actually it's, that too is not entirely obvious because you could argue you have a bit of a hydrogen bond here, but this is not really a real hydrogen bond. It's sharing it and everything, and that having your own hydrogen bond is much better than sharing. It's so like in a part. So that the delta E is gonna be negative if they interact. The delta S, Uh, so that, so this, we, in general, we can't say here, right? This will depend a little bit on how much, what is the entropy drop for the two helices versus how, do, how much do we gain from the hydrogen bond? And in most of these cases, the hydrogen bond is more important than the small freedom the helices would have. So what happens here is that the reason why we see these serine and threeness in nature, it actually creates a beautiful driving force for nature to form helix interactions. So that you can insert the individual helix, it's not good, but we can insert that serine if there's lots of other hydrophobic residues. And the second they are in the membrane, this is gonna create the nice downhill path that you encourage the helices to interact because then they can form hydrogen bonds. One of the original reasons we had this in the course is that when this was discovered some 20 years ago, people were super excited and me included. And I've written my fair share of research grants where I argue that we should be able to understand membrane protein formation this way but what Lucy might have told you in the membrane protein lecture is that membrane proteins are difficult because they're hydrophobic everywhere. Uh, it's not easy to predict them. So as good hopes we had about this and we hope that this was just the first pattern. This is why really why likely why Lucy didn't bring it up. Um, this was just the first pattern and at the time we hope we're gonna find another 100 patterns and we've found all those patterns. We will be able to use bioinformatics to predict how helices will interact. The only problem is that we haven't found any more patterns since. So it was, I wouldn't say an exception. We learned lots of things about how helices interact, but it was not the answer to uh, membrane protein structure prediction. But the interesting thing here is that just as nature can somehow engineer what things should interact, maybe we too can try to engineer how things will interact. So Lucy did talk about the receptor protein tyrosine, RTKs, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors, right? I'm not gonna go through all their normal function, but these are membrane proteins that usually, they frequently just have a single helix to the membrane. And then they work by, under some conditions, you have a ligand that binds and the ligand causes this dimers to come together. And when they come together, good things happen in the cell. Well, you usually get signals here that leads to cell growth and signaling on the inside. And this continues to signal on the inside until they eventually spontaneously dissociate again. Unfortunately, and this, this works in your bodies all the time. Unfortunately, there are some examples where this goes wrong. Um, and what happens is you have the normal signaling, the ligand binds, uh, and you have the functionally active dimer that starts as in signaling, 
and then things should dissociate, but unfortunately there are some examples even with single residue mutants in the helices, and then the helices stick together too much. And the problem is that if this helices stick together too much, it doesn't help if the ligand dissociates and everything. If they stick together, they will continue to signal cell growth. Divide, divide, divide. And you can probably guess what that leads to, right? Tumors, uh, very severe tumors. And we've even identified, we know what this mutation is. I, I, I don't remember the time. Either it's an alanine uh, that turned into valine or uh, vice versa. Very simple mutation. And it's just a single transmembrane helix. It doesn't get much more simple than that. And it's virtually impossible for us to get anything we can treat it with. Uh, so the treatment would historically try to be prevent cell growth or something. But what we would, of course, like to do, couldn't we have a toolbox that we selectively go in and disrupt this bad interaction between the helices? So imagine that we could create some sort of superhero red helix, an intercepting peptide. So this intercepting peptide, I need to design this red peptide so it should have super strong binding affinity to the blue bad helix, but it should ideally not bind the green good helices. So I should be able to turn off, I should be able to bind to the blue helix and block this interaction, because if the red is already bound to the blue, this other blue will not be able to bind it, right? And at least in some sort of science fiction manner, I should be able to turn this off. So there was a team led by Bill de Grader that actually did this uh, some 12 years ago, I think it was. Um, so their idea was literally to use these results of the simple glycophorin dimers and see if we can design arbitrary peptide. Can we design a custom create an interaction between peptides? So my peptide would bind, say, strongly to your peptide, but not your peptide. Uh, and in principle, it's super easy, right? You just need to find something that to disable this interaction or something. Oh, sorry. Create an interaction here so that the two pairs of the native um, or disease um, helices don't interact. So in this case, they needed slightly more freedom. And they didn't start directly from this glycophorin helices. But what, uh, what they started from is that they created a database. of. They looked at all the helices that are present in the protein data bank. There are just 100,000 proteins, not that many. And then they cluster these um, so that you know, there might be 20 large clusters. And yes, there are probably a lots of small clusters too. But in general, let's, let's not try to fool nature. If, it's, if there are 10 or 20 very common conformations of two helices when they stick together, that's likely because that's a favorable, good way to pack two helices, right? And if we don't think that we're smarter than nature, let's copy nature. So what they did is that they took these 20 largest clusters and then if we're going to have two helices interacting, these are completely different helices. But if I would now like to create a custom interaction, say, between the red and the green helix here, in all likelihood, they will have to pack roughly the same way our other helices in nature pack. So that they just took the sequences, and then they put the sequences in helices, and then they tried each of these 20 different conformations. And then they let computers chew over this for a few weeks or something, and that can you just try to for each conformation of two helices that I give you, try to pack the side chains. Try to pack the side chains. Try to pack the side chains. Pack the side chains in the best possible way you can do. And not only that, then we're also going to need to try different side chains, right? Because if I'm going to create a custom red helix here, I can choose the amino acid composition. But then I also need to bias myself. This has to be something that will go into a membrane. So it has to be relatively hydrophobic. Uh, and then I might be able to insert a few hydrophilic residues, like the ones we had in the GX3G. And to make a very long story short, this worked. Uh, so they could create helices that they first showed that they could pack well. They form helices, which is not obvious. A random amino acid sequence will not form a helix. But as you showed in the first lab, that is something we're fairly good at predicting. What they then also showed is that they could create helices that had affinity so that they could show that the helices that we now design, they will, well, first you can show that they will bind very well just in a computer. They will have a large buried surface area, so they will pack nicely together. But they also then showed that if you now put this in a, an assay and go and test it with cells, it appears to have some sort of effect. And at the very final layer, they can actually show that if they now introduce this in cells and platelets actually, they can create very specific effects and block out just the inactive compounds here. So this actually worked. Uh, and I think they, they sold the results to pharmaceutical company. I'm not sure. I haven't followed this the last five, 10 years to see whether anything has come out of it. 
Uh, it might not. Remember what I told Lozic, most things will fail, but I bet that there are a whole lot of other studies trying to go in this direction. And even if it does succeed, it might be, if, if this turned into successful drugs, it's probably about now that we would see it, 10 years later or so. This was merely the first example. It doesn't really get a whole lot simpler than a single helix. But you see the difference with the drug thing? We're not here, we're not trying to screen any type of, sorry, we're not trying to screen a database with a billion compounds. We're custom designing one compound to fit a bad pattern that we would like to turn off, and it kind of works. Uh, here too, though, I would expect, if this is gonna be used as a drug, you might need to refine it further and everything. It's also, it sounds very easy to just shut off the process. The only problem is that if you, if you have cells dividing too much, I want to reduce it a bit. We might not want to completely shut off all cell division in your body because that will likely mean you die. So there are, there are a billion more things that could go wrong. But the point is that there are ways that we can start to custom interact with processes in your cells by designing proteins all the way in the computer. The cool thing with this is that they're way more potent. If you think, with a drug, we're normally happy if we can get it down to, say, a nonomolar or something. That means that the lower the concentration, that's the concentration we have 50% of it bound. And the lower this concentration is, the more potent, the more active it is. Proteins, they can easily be a million times more efficient. So they're extremely small doses. They will have super high specificity because, again, this is based on protein folding. You need a very specific packing of all the side chains or you're not going to interact at all. So this peptide that I showed you, it's likely not going to interact with any other protein whatsoever in your body. There are no side effects, in theory. Uh, and this is starting to be pretty interesting if you're running a pharma company, right? Very potent, higher specificity. This specificity means you're hardly going to have any side effects. Uh, we can custom design it for pretty much any disease. We don't need to rely on anything that's already out there in nature. This is where CEO starts to see lots of dollar signs. Uh, there are a few problems. This requires injection, just like insulin. Why? You largely transport in the blood. Uh, but there's something before the blood. Does your blood transport proteins? So what's the color of your blood? Red. Why is it? Yes, it's red because of the hemoglobin binding iron. So the, yeah, there are lots of protein in your blood. So there's something before that it gets into the blood. Sorry? So what happens when you take a drug? Pill. What happens when you take it? Where does it go? Yes. So let's say that. What happens if you have a, if you have a steak for lunch? Where does it go? in your stomach. And what does your stomach do with the steak? Yes, uh, the uh, muscles, that's protein, right? A steak is protein. Your stomach degrades proteins. So that if you're now making drugs that are proteins, they're gonna be degraded by your stomach. That's what your, the enzymes in your stomach are for. Uh, so we're gonna need to bypass that. And the obvious way to bypass it is that you need to inject it directly in the blood. And again, if you're curing a cancer, you're probably happy for that, but you're not, you don't want two injections per day for a lifestyle disease. They might become very expensive to synthesize because we now need to produce the drug in bacteria. On the other hand, given the cost of normal drugs, there's usually not too much of an issue. The other problem is that they might clear very fast from the body. Just the way you need to take, normally a pill, you need to take one per, uh, well, maybe two or three pills per day, right? Here too, you're gonna need two or three injections per day. Because you're not, just because it's a protein, your body doesn't produce the protein. It's an external protein that we're injecting. So there are a bunch of problems. Um, there is still quite a lot of money to be made though. If we're slightly less sexy than those membrane proteins, do you know about the company Novo Nordisk? It's the largest company in Scandinavia. What do they do? They specialize in diabetes care. It was the largest, one of the first companies to start to produce insulin. And it has a stock market, I think the market capitalization is on like 900 billion Swedish kroner, far larger than Ericsson or anything. Uh, and it's probably a quarter of Denmark's exports. Insulin is a complicated drug right? because in theory it's easy to make, but it's also, 
It's a drug that if you're depending on your blood sugar level, uh, it takes a long, it can take even take hours or something for normal insulin to start acting. Uh, so you would like drugs that's, that's very easy to control, in particular these modern pumps or something, so that if you detect that you would like to adjust your blood sugar level, you would like to be able to do it within the course of minutes instead of hours. Uh, so there are some peptides or something that in principle leads to insulin release that could be used to do this. Uh, the GLP-1 is one of them. Uh, but it has a half-life of roughly 30 minutes in the bloodstream. So it's not going to work. So what Novo Nordisk developed a few years ago, they developed a, a protein called uh, liraglutide. It has a market name. Let's see what that is. Victoza. Um, I haven't heard of the market name. Uh, which is a, the same protein, but you've fused a fatty acid chain to this lysine here. And it seems completely arbitrary. Uh, and suddenly you get a half-life of every 10 to 15 hours, which means that you just need to inject it once per day, and it will slowly release. And the reason for that is that uh, it will basically bind to fat tissues or something, and they will slowly have a little bit of it in the bloodstream. Far nicer, you get a slow, low, continuous release, and you don't need to take it all the time. Uh, Magnus used to give this course. The, the reason why I have this slide is actually part of his work. So what they've been working a lot on is trying to computationally optimize this. First, understand why this happens, adjust the, the size of these chains, and also understand why, well, first, why does this happen, and can you try to improve these properties? Um, and the reason uh, for the prolonged life, let's say it, it binds to albumin in blood, and the other part is that these fatty chains, they tend to interact. So you form these heptamers with seven units in them. And this is actually good, because as long as they're a heptamer, they're not going to interact. And then they slowly dissociate. And you get the nice, low, continuous dose where you gradually build up the concentration of insulin in the blood, blood rather than having a large, instantaneous, so-called bolus dose. So that, in principle, regulating your insulin level is not that hard. But the hard thing is doing it in a way that will make your body survive for 80 years or something so that we don't stress the body. And that's usually what leads to the side, long-term side effects in diabetes care. So here, too, uh, a whole lot of this is based on computationally trying to optimize the interactions of these proteins. There was another example a few years ago, not by Novo Nordisk, but uh, Eli Lilly. Normal insulin would form hexamers, and they wanted to disrupt this to get something that could act slightly faster. So they realized that as part of those interactions, there was one lysine, uh, sorry, one proline and one lysine that were interacting. And they if they just swapped the order of those, they would kind of destroy the binding interface between the molecules a bit. Uh, so then they created something called LISPRO, L-I-S-P-R-O, uh, just have a market name for it. And that was like 10 times faster release. So again, very, very small changes in the proteins that are, to tell the truth, probably just based on sitting and looking very carefully at these molecules in a molecular viewer and then coming up with ideas. They probably tried 500 other things before they found this one. And that's, of course, not the long-term sustainable view. But the point is that we can, there are some pretty darn cool things we can do by trying to change protein structure. So we can get small changes, sorry, we can get some improvements by doing small changes. Why don't we do large changes? It seems stupid. Why, why would you just swap the lysine and proline residues? Couldn't you start to change 20 residues and then we could get something that maybe has a hundredfold improvement? So what did I say when we started about the design? The problem is that if you change too much, what happens? You no longer have a protein, right? It's not going to fold. So that we have to be very, very conservative and do small changes. This got super hot some eight, seven years ago with a number of companies buying other companies doing this type of design. Uh, um, and you might have heard something, in particular when it comes to designing antibodies. It's still super hot. Uh, have you heard about a company called Tegenero? So this was a super map, they call it a special class, a very, very, very special antibody, uh, and that they want to design antibodies to target uh, lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, and the particular drug, actually wasn't a drug, a drug candidate called TGN1412. Drugs frequent, drug candidates frequently just have names uh, in the uh, companies. And this was the CD28 is the name, uh, 
relative to the receptor. So that the idea here is that we would call this to bind. It should activate the CD28 receptors on T cells. And the T cells, that then they, they uh, kickstart the entire machinery with killer cells and everything. And then you would have basically find a way to jumpstart the immune defense so that your immune defense would then take care of the uh, cancer cells. That sounds like a pretty neat thing if we could accomplish it, right? Uh, this went exceptionally well. All the preclinical studies were awesome. You have beautiful binding interfaces. You tried it in mice, perfect results. It really, you really could get the immune system to take care of the cancer cells. And then you went to phase one, where it was a complete disaster. So what is phase one? A bit of repetition here too. What do we do in phase one studies? So when I say disaster, it doesn't sound so bad with the chemistry experiment going wrong. Happens all the time in the lab, right? Human trials. And not just any type of humans. Healthy humans, you want to make sure that nothing bad happens. With, you're not trying to treat anything yet. You just Everything worked really well in the lab. So you find some healthy test subjects like students and give them $50 to try a drug that has worked really well in the lab. There shouldn't be any problem. Uh, we'll, and just to be safe, we'll give you a 10 times lower dose per kilo than the mice had. It shouldn't be any danger whatsoever. They had, I think it was 10 or 12 students come in, and uh, they administered very small amounts. Within 15, 30 minutes, uh, their heads, hands, all the extremities had swollen to twice the size. They were very close to dying. Uh, I actually think all of them survived, but they had to amputate a whole lot of their extremities and everything. You can imagine the company kind of bent bankrupt after that. They pulled it. And we don't know exactly what happened, uh, but there, are, there is some speculation. So one problem, is, this is what we call a super antagonist. Uh, so it's, it's not, remember that as we spoke about agonists or as a, ag, uh, su, uh, sorry, not antagonist, super agonist. We spoke about agonists, and this is super agonist that is somehow have a 10,000 times stronger effect than the normal agonist. And the point is that we derive this for humans, because obviously that's our long-term goal. And human and mice, they share some like 93% sequence, which is good. But 93% is not 100%. And in the extracellular part where this is going to bind, it's something like two-thirds of the sequence that's shared. So the question is, how much antibody should I now administer? If I administer this in a mouse, it's not going to fit perfectly. So I, have to, I keep increasing the dose a little bit until I find a level where I activate the mouse, the mice, yeah, the mice immune system just enough. And then it works well. Then we take this drug and inject it into you. The only problem is that this drug now fits 100.0%. Your entire immune system is going to be completely berserk. So the problem is that we've effectively administered a dose that's 10,000 times too high for you. Uh, this is never going to release. Uh, it's, it's, it's literally, they're made for each other. We, we designed something that would fit your uh, CD28 receptors perfectly. And what now happens is that when your immune system goes berserk, the, well, you're activating your immune system to 10,000% too. That's like giving somebody a Kalashnikov. They basically, the immune system will try to shoot all over the place. Uh, so the immune system is now trying to kill everything it can find, including your own healthy body. Likely. Uh, we don't know. Um, so that what likely happened is that what, what we thought went so well, well, what they thought went so well in the test system was likely only a very weak partial activation. But when you suddenly got, when you administered it in human that it was designed for, you got a way too strong activation. Um, after those trials, this wasn't exactly a matter of saying, okay, let's do it again. Um, so that the, I think the company went bankrupt. They, tried, they canceled the entire trials, of course. Uh, slightly less than 10 years. But the point is, that, and this sounds horrible, that the approach was not bad. It's super interesting, right? It's difficult. It's exceptionally difficult and dangerous. Uh, but this is opening the door to a completely computational design of drugs. Uh, we have no limitations whatsoever of sticking to what we know. And I think in particular in cancer, this is going to be a revolution within the next decade. We can do other things too. I'm going to spend, uh, I have 10 more slides. I will take five minutes, more minutes or so. Um, Lucy talked about voltage-gated ion channels, I think. These are involved in lots of normal behavior, but there are also some diseases. Um, there are, you can have a lot of heart-related diseases, but also epilepsy. Uh, 
And some 10 years ago, uh, people realized that there are certain cases of epilepsy that you can treat with polyunsaturated fatty acids. So it's basically fat with lots of double bonds. And if you administer enough of these fatty acids, all the symptoms disappear. So this is just certain types of epilepsy, in particular among children and whether it's uh, based on genetic uh, disorders. And if you understand a little bit about these channels, fatty acids are interesting in that they have negative charges. And as Lucy hopefully mentioned, that a lot of these voltage-gated channels have lots of positive charges. So maybe, just maybe, they are interacting with each other. So what colleagues of us down in Linköping have done, for, they've worked in these channels in the lab for several years. They had this idea that maybe a whole lot of these disorders, they are related to the mutants in these channels. And what might actually happen is that you might have channels that they kind of work, but they don't open as much as they should. And if we now insert lots of fatty acids with a negative charge here, that negative charge up here in the head group is, might help pull the protein up a bit and help open it. The problem with the fatty acid, you need to eat very large amounts of it and it's not very healthy long term. Um, but this is an example where people accept the side effects because the epilepsy is far worse. But what if we could design custom drugs that had the same effect, but say a thousand times stronger? So in principle, you just need to start looking at these fatty acids. We had a postdoc a few years who started to do this in the simulations. It turns out this one doesn't work at all. It doesn't bind, while this one is perfect. Uh, and it's because they have slightly different properties. The ones with the double bonds, they're slightly more polar. Double bonds tend to be more polar. So these will interact with the charged parts of the protein slightly easier. And then, of course, you have the chart in the head group here. While these normal fatty acids, they behave pretty much like lipids. And I wish that I could give you the final result of this, but this is still work going on. Uh, but what we have done is that they've, we've been able to identify the specific residues in this voltage sensor where they are interacting. You can confirm this by now mutating these residues, and if you show that if you mutate away those residues, the fatty acids will no longer work with it. And then Frederick's team in parallel, they've had an organic chemist now try to use docking, exactly like you're going to do in Hanley Task 3. So we've been using docking and trying to find interesting compounds and see what are the properties of those compounds that would make them bind here. And then they've also been manufacturing these compounds in the lab. Uh, and this went so well that they have a bunch of them that they have uh, requested patents for and then published. And the idea there now is that we, they're going to try to turn this well. At some point, they might very well try to sell it to a company, but see if they can actually get something on the market that would selectively treat this type of epilepsy because it's like 10,000 times better affinity than the normal fatty acids. How this will work, uh, that remains to be seen. But the point is that there is a lot we can do just by looking at things and understanding how they interact. 10 years ago, this too would have been science fiction. And I, I never thought that this would succeed when we started working on it. The final example I'm going to have, that the drawback with all these things is still we're basing on simulations, we're basing on structures that we know. That's partly because we need to walk before we run. But the really cool way to do this, uh, what if you could start out with a completely blank sheet? And let's say that I would like to literally design proteins from scratch. You have a, you're giving me a particular receptor that we would need to combat. I'm not going to use anything in the protein data bank. And when Lucy spoke about bioinformatics, um, we talked about sequence similarity, right? You talked that we can build models and other models and everything. And you can think of some, this blue part, you can think of this as some sort of arbitrary space of protein sequences or structure. And those yellow parts, these are native proteins, proteins that do exist. And they exist all over this uh, part of space. And of course, what we did before is I tried to create a new protein that was just on top of some other protein. The stuff that I mentioned about bacteria, directed evolution, it might be possible if I have a certain function that I would like to achieve, I might be able to get lots of sequences to move in that direction. And that's what you can call directed evolution. That will likely be reasonably close to other proteins, but maybe I can move those parts a bit to create some sort of property or a state that is good. But the really big prize here is all the blue parts. What if I could create something there? not even close to any other proteins, completely from scratch. Not build on a model or any protein, but use all the freedom of creating proteins. And in particular, David Baker's group at University of Washington, they are insanely good at this. Uh, so they are using computational methods, combining bioinformatics and molecular simulation and models. So you're basically starting from something, you're predicting what the entire overall shape of the protein should be. You create amino acids that will hopefully create that shape. 
and then you need to start to iteratively or repeatedly optimize your side chains and everything and place the side chains to realize, do we expect this to be a stable fold? Can I change the amino acids to make this fold even more stable? Uh, and then hopefully we should be able to find something that, so that the lowest RMST to the target should really be the sequence that has the lowest energy there too. And then we take that sequence in the lab and then we keep our breath and hope that it's gonna fall to that sequence. People have of course been trying that for 25 years and there's usually a very simple answer to that question and that answer is no, it won't. But what's happened in the last 10 years that the answer first started to be one in 100. Well, maybe, and then it was yes, once in 100. And today it's kind of like 50-50. So this is improving every year. And this is a remarkably cool example from a, from a competition that they have every few years. So based on a crystal structure, they predicted, sorry, there was another group determining a structure. This is their prediction, where they did not know the structure. They just knew what the amino acid sequence was. After the prediction, people told them what the structure was. And this is the crystal structure. Pretty insane. This is not an easy protein. We're not talking just packing some helices, right? And uh, there are two papers that I've uploaded to a canvas, in particular one of these to look at it. I'm not going to ask you questions specifically about this paper, and that's why I'm not printing a copy for you. But they go through a whole range of examples of what they can do. They can create self-assembling materials. So if you create small parts of beta sheets in particular, you can get them to bind in small patterns, and then you can get these patterns to assemble into larger patterns. And these larger patterns, you're essentially treating proteins like they were crystals or Lego building blocks. Remember what I did when we talked about uh, fibrous proteins, your hair and everything, right? So this, these aren't fibrous proteins, they're globular proteins, but we can use them almost as if they were fibrous proteins to custom design biotechnology building blocks. It's not used yet in biotech, but I bet it's only gonna be a matter of time before people use this to say, well, create biofuel reactors or something. Uh, because if we now create, make these to turn them into a catalyst too, we can get them to catalyze pretty much any reaction we want. The other thing that they show in this paper is that they can create hyperstable peptides. So these are tiny proteins. Uh, and then they can engineer in some disulfide bridges. So why would a disulfide bridge make a protein hyperstable? It's a covalent bond, right? It's not just an interaction, but you for me, this disulfide bridge is a bond that will never break. But there are other proteins that have that. What they also show is that, you know, if you create a protein, normally you would have the N terminus there and the C terminus there. But if we design a protein where the N and C terminus are close to each other, under some conditions, we can also then create a chemical reaction to fuse that again, to close the loop. So then you have a, literally, you have a circular protein. That's gonna be even more stable. So now you have three links within the protein and I'm not sure if you, if you have a piece of yarn and they're trying to unnest it, right? If the yarn was circular, it's gonna be pretty difficult to unnest it. So where, we, where could you imagine using this? Based on what we talked the entire first part of the lecture today. Why would you want a protein to be super stable? Exactly right. So if you now can custom engineer a protein that's exceptionally stable, so stable that it would normally not unfold, then we have a protein that would likely be able to survive the digestive tract. And then you can do custom designed proteins that you can administer orally. So you get rid of by far the largest problem with protein design. There is one more thing that I might have mentioned at the very first lecture or two. There's another strategy that people use to try to get through the digestive tract. You're gonna hear more of David. Uh, this might very well be a Nobel Prize for him in the future because it's, uh, they're so amazingly good. There could be another way that people use, essentially what you wanna create proteins that are bio-incompatible. Because if you're compatible with the biology in your body, your body will digest the proteins. So I would like something that is a protein, but I would like it to not be compatible with your proteins. You remember something I talked about the very first lecture even, or the second? Do you remember these things? So what was that? Sorry? Sorry? 
the handedness of the amino acids, right? So essentially you can create that alpha helix that would be a mirror image. And this mirror image will mean that it's all the, all the uh, enzymes that would normally say break a peptide bond, they recognize normal amino acids. But if I have the opposite type of amino acids, it's not going to recognize it. But still, all the laws of physics apply. So in principle, they can form stable compounds and everything, but they will likely not be digested. But making that type of amino acids, it's expensive, hard, and everything. This is much more feasible and nicer to work with. I think that's all I had, uh, both for this lecture and course contents. Um, I don't think there's probably not a whole lot point of recording the other part here, but what I figured that we're gonna spend as much time as you want here, some questions and answers, both for the hand-in task and the uh, exam.